All right. Well, good morning. My name is John Miller. I'm a member of Meadowbrook Church. My family and I have been attending here since about 2011, and uh, we absolutely love having Meadowbrook as our church home. So today we're going to be concluding the series that we have been in studying the book of Colossians. Personally, I've found this study to be very relevant to my life. I think the overarching point that Paul is making throughout the book of Colossians is that there is no part of our lives, no part of this world, no aspect of humanity that has been left untouched by the love of Jesus. Throughout this letter, Paul is turning society on its head. He is showing us that Jesus has triumphed. And because Jesus has triumphed, we are to be living today in this very moment the way that we will one day live in heaven. See, Colossians is often thought of as a very theological book, but when we actually understand the theology that Paul is teaching, we realize it has very practical implications in our lives. It changes our perspectives, and as we're going to see this morning, it changes everything all the way down to how we relate with one another. Paul concludes this letter the way that he concludes many of his letters, by addressing his friends. And oftentimes, we skip over sections of verses like this, maybe just because we see a list of names and we think to ourselves, well, what am I going to say about that? Or maybe it's just because the names are so incredibly difficult to pronounce. But I really appreciate the way that Brian laid this series out, that he dedicated an entire Sunday morning to these verses, because this is where Paul begins to get at the relational side of things. And whether we realize it or not, relationships have a tremendous impact on our faith journey. The people around us affect us. I mean, when we think about something like even why we go to the church we go to, right? I mean, certainly we've got to find a church that aligns with our spiritual beliefs. But beyond that, typically we go to a church because we walk through the doors, we feel welcomed, we feel comfortable, we connect with the people, and it becomes our church home. Or when you think about the reason many people will leave a church that they've been involved in for some time, very often it's about relationships, right? Somebody says something or does something we don't like, and we think to ourselves, I'm out of here, right? Or how many people do we know who struggle to engage with faith at all because they know a Christian who said or did something, right? Or a pastor or a priest who said or did something, and now they struggle to have a relationship with Jesus, struggle to come to church, struggle with faith, all together. When I, uh, shortly after I graduated from college, I went to school in La Crosse, and uh, I was involved at a church there in La Crosse through my college years. After I graduated, I went on staff uh, to work with their youth ministry, and shortly after I went on staff, they started going through a church split. It was a really ugly time in the life of that church. Uh, We would have church meetings, and people would stand up and say, all kinds of terrible things to one another, and oftentimes people would leave the meeting very upset and angry. In fact, some people would walk out and say things like, I am never going to church again after seeing all of this. And the crazy thing to me is that it had nothing to do with theology. It had everything to do with relationships that had gone bad. See, the funny catch-22 of church sometimes is the relationships, right? It's, it's the people, You know, sometimes the great thing about Jesus' church can be his people, but frankly, sometimes the hard thing about Jesus' church can be his people. The people around us have a tremendous impact on our faith journey, and that's why we certainly don't want to skip over verses like these where Paul begins to get at the relational side of things. Ultimately, I think the, the point we're going to see this morning is that Paul makes clear to us that the ministry of Jesus, that the church, is not just about one person. It never has been, right? In the first century, it wasn't just about the Apostle Paul. Today, it isn't just about any one particular pastor. This is about a community of people of faith coming together for the purpose of proclaiming the gospel to the world around us. But if we're going to do that well, if we're going to function as a healthy church or a healthy ministry, there are some things that just sort of need to be in the relational fabric of our church. And that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. If you have your Bibles with you, I would encourage you to open them up to Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. And uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, as um, Jill had mentioned, there are uh, some available for you in the pew racks and in those pew Bibles. Colossians chapter 4 is on page 1,185. If you're joining us online this morning, welcome. We're so glad that you're with us and the word should show up on your video feed 
as well. But as we're reading through these verses, I'm going to point out just a couple of things that Paul mentions that are of great importance in our relationships with one another. And they are faithfulness, encouragement, and forgiveness. Faithfulness, encouragement, and forgiveness. But before we turn to the scriptures, let's first begin with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for the many lessons that we've learned from the Colossians. We pray that as Paul continues to teach us what it looks like to live as your people in your kingdom, that we would allow it to change how we live in this very moment. Lord, this morning as we consider how we relate to one another, which sometimes can be the most difficult part of this whole thing, we pray that you would teach us how to be faithful, encouraging, and forgiving friends to one another. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as Paul begins his conclusion of Colossians, at least this final part, uh, we're going to pick it up in Colossians chapter 4, verse 7. Here's what he says. Tychicus, and by the way, this is what I mean about names that are difficult to say. You wouldn't believe how many times they had to practice that one. <laughs> Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord. One of the first things we notice here is the importance of faithfulness. If you remember back several weeks ago when Nate was just kind of getting this series rolling, he pointed out that Paul refers to the Colossians as being faithful believers. And he does it in such a way that he's like calling them, right? He's encouraging them to be faithful. When we think about what it means to be faithful, I think in the most simplistic of terms, it means we show up, right? When you think about a faithful volunteer, what does that mean? It means they show up week after week. When you think about a faithful friend, what does that mean? It means a friend that's, that's with you when, yeah, when things are fun and easy, but also that friend who is there with you when things are hard and inconvenient. They're there with us speaking truth into our lives. And what we realize is that throughout Paul's ministry, he had faithful friends who were there by his side. They're friends that he could always depend on to be there to speak truth into his life. But it wasn't just Paul, really. When we look throughout the scriptures, we see examples of people who were highly engaged in God's ministry, and they always had faithful friends who were there by their sides. As Paul begins thinking about his faithful friends in this section of verses, the first person he mentions is Tychicus. Tychicus was well known in the early church. He carried out a variety of of ministry roles on behalf of his friend Paul, and he was one of Paul's longtime traveling partners. And the significance of that should not be missed. I mean, maybe you've got a friend that you like going on vacation with, or a family you like traveling with. That's not the idea here, right? Paul and Tychicus are not going on a luxury cruise around the Greek islands. Traveling with Paul was anything but easy. It meant things like shipwrecks, right? beatings, floggings, imprisonment. I mean, only the most faithful friend would have stuck with Paul through all of that. In fact, there are examples of other guys that bailed out on Paul, probably the most famous being Mark. He became well-known in the early church as a guy that bailed on one of Paul's missionary journeys. And Paul has to remind the church to be welcoming and hospitable towards Mark. I personally think Mark just gets a really bad rap, right? I mean, he travels with Paul when things were easy, when they're close to home, when they're being welcomed. But when things got crazy, right, when the beatings start, uh, he looked at it and said, whoa, whoa, hey, I didn't sign up for this. I'm, I'm going back home. And I've got a feeling if we're honest with ourselves, most of us would have gone home with Mark, right? Maybe it'd be fun to travel with Paul in areas where he's welcomed, where the churches wanted him, where they provided a place for them to sleep. But when the beatings start, when the floggings start, I've got a feeling most of us would look at it and say, whoa, whoa, Paul, I didn't, I didn't sign up to go to jail over this. Like, I'm, I'm going home with Mark, right? Only the most faithful of friends would have stuck with Paul through all of that, and that friend was Tychicus. And because of it, Paul entrusted him with some very important, yet often forgotten, ministry roles. One of them is that Tychicus would carry Paul's letters to the churches. In those days, you couldn't just drop a letter in the mail and have it show up. Someone actually had to take the often very difficult journey of delivering the letter. And writing a letter in those days was no small feat, right? The materials to write were expensive and it would have taken a lot of time and effort. I mean, think about it this way. 
What has it taken us? Three months to read through Colossians? How much time do you think it took to write Colossians? And after putting that much energy, effort, and finances into something, the last thing you want to do is give it to someone who's not going to get it there, right? And so he gives it to his most faithful friend to deliver the letter. And then when he would show up at the churches, Paul would entrust him to speak on his behalf. And that takes a lot of trust, right? I mean, Paul couldn't call and find out what he was saying. He just had to trust that Tychicus was speaking well on his behalf. And then when Paul would call the early church pastors for their sabbaticals, guys like Timothy and Titus, when it was time for them to go on sabbatical, to be with Paul, to be trained, to be encouraged by him, Paul would send Tychicus to go and fill in at the churches to continue carrying on the ministry there. Faithfulness is a wonderful quality, but one, frankly, that's kind of hard to find. But the reality is that all of us need faithful friends, don't we? I mean, we all need that friend who, yeah, is going to be there when it's fun, but also the friend that's going to be there when we really need them, when things are hard. They're speaking truth into our lives. And here's the reality. If we all need friends like that, that means we need to be friends like that to others, right? Not the friend that's always bailing, coming up with an excuse in the last minute. Not the friend that never shows up when it's inconvenient, but the person who's always there for our friends speaking truth into their lives. And, it's, and that kind of faithfulness is rare and it's extremely attractive to the world around us. What do you mean? How often do we hear somebody share their testimony about how they came to faith and it starts with, hey, I had this friend, right? I had this friend who was always there with me, always encouraging me, and finally I started going to church and then it goes on with the story, right? This kind of faithfulness is so important in our relationships with one another. And so Paul points out faithfulness. The second thing he points out here is the importance of encouragement. As the text continues, here's what Paul says. This is verse 8. He says, I am sending him, Tychicus, to you for the expressed purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. Tychicus was often sent to the churches with the expressed purpose purpose of encouragement. He would go to these new churches, these young believers, and he would encourage them. Encouragement is something that is often lacking in our world. I think in the competitive culture that we live in, it's much easier to be discouraging than encouraging towards one another. I've got a feeling encouragement is probably something most of us could use a little bit more of on a regular basis. I think that's generally true today, and I have to imagine it was generally true 2,000 years ago as well, and that's why Paul would send him to go and encourage these churches. But often when it comes to the topic of encouragement, we miss a little nuance of what Paul has to say here. Because did you notice that he said, for the purpose of encouragement, the Tychicus is going to share the exact circumstances of Paul's life, right? What's really going on in Paul's life? life. He's going to share that with the church, and then he's going to go back to Paul and share with them the exact circumstances of what is going on in the life of the church. My point here is that if we're going to truly encourage one another, we need to know what is going on in each other's lives. Right? I mean, certainly I can stand up here and throw out some blanket statement encouragement, but if I'm actually going to encourage you in the way that your souls need to be encouraged, I need to know what's actually going on in your life. And the same is true of me, right? I can't expect to be encouraged by you or by the, the church if I'm not honest about the reality of my circumstances, right? If I'm going through some really hard stuff, but I come to church every week and pretend like everything's okay and great, I can't expect to find the encouragement that my soul truly needs. And I think that's why Paul sets this example for us, of saying, hey, remember my chains, right? He says, remember, I'm, I'm struggling right now. I need your prayers. I need your empathy. Like things aren't all neat and perfect in my life. So I think part of the challenge for us here is that, well, even though we know it's not true, we tend to believe that if we're really good Christians, our lives will be neat and tidy and pretty, right? But as I read through the scriptures, I, I can't help but conclude that maybe just the opposite is true, right? I mean, when we look at some of the big hitters of the faith, guys like Moses, right? Moses had these just mountaintop experiences with God, but 
You know, he also hit some pretty low valleys too where it almost seemed like he was dealing some amount of, with some amount of depression in his life. Or when we look at somebody like King David, right, the man after God's own heart. But you know his marriage was on the rocks? You know some of his kids hated him? You know he had a, a mess in his life from some of the bad decisions he'd made in the past. I mean, he was anything but neat and pretty. Right, and here's the reality for us. There are people in our church who are outstanding Christians, who have a strong faith, yet they're dealing with all kinds of crazy stuff in their lives. Some of us have our marriages on the rocks. Some of us are struggling with our relationship with our kids or with our parents. Some of us are dealing with a variety of addictions. Some of us just have this mess in our lives right now that we're going through because of decisions that we have made in the past. But if we're not honest about it, with the people around us, we're never going to find the encouragement that our souls need. One of my favorite authors, uh, Chuck Swindoll, says that you know what the church really needs is an open mic night where we all get up and share our biggest failures, which I've always been kind of amused by the idea, but I've got a feeling it would actually be quite helpful, right? Because what, what would happen is, is we're sharing our biggest struggles and our biggest failures. There are going to be other people in the church who are going to have gone through the exact same kinds of things and are going to know how to encourage us in the way our souls need to be encouraged. See, oftentimes we build these very deep and significant connections with people who have had the same types of life experiences that we've had, right? I remember back in 2011, um, I was going through a very significant career change, and I decided to start my own business. And if you remember back to 2011, it was a terrible time to start your own business. The economy was in the toilet. Banks weren't lending. But I wrote up a business plan that I thought was absolutely brilliant. And I shared it with several people that I view as really wise business people. And several of them came back to me and told me, you know, it's never going to work, right? But I continued to believe in it, and so I, I continued pushing forward. And I was teetering between th thinking I was doing the right thing and thinking you're making the biggest mistake of your life, you know. And uh, Beck and I are trying to figure things out, like how to pay the bills, how to get health insurance. Ultimately, we had to sell our house. We used to live just right around the corner here, and we had to sell our house to free up some capital to alleviate some bills. It's e anything but an easy time, right? But as I was going through that, I ended up connecting with several people in the church who were much much older than I was at the time, but they'd started their own businesses many years earlier, and so they knew how to encourage me, how to advise me as I was going through this, how to speak into my life, how to pray for me. Right? See, as we're going through things, if we're honest about our circumstances, we end up connecting with other people who have gone through the same types of things. My wife and I used to do foster care, and we've got a lot of friends who are still involved in foster care. If you've ever done foster care or know somebody who has, you realize that it presents some very unique challenges, right? You get these innocent children who come into your life. They become part of your family. But sometimes the foster care system itself can be absolutely brutal, right? My, my buddy and his wife had two kids that had lived with them for several years. They're on the pathway towards adoption. And so they're really beginning to build some strong connection with these children. And a couple of weeks ago, they got a call from the foster care agency letting them know that the kids were going to be picked up in about an hour to go live somewhere else so that they could be with family. And obviously, my buddy and his wife were just devastated, right? The children were upset. It was a terrible situation. But Becca and I had been through something much less dramatic, but something similar many years ago. And so we were able to pray for him, to empathize for him, to try to encourage him as he was going through this. See, when we're honest about our circumstances, we build connections with other people in the church who have been through the same kinds of things and are going to know how to encourage us. But if we're not honest about it, we can't expect to find the encouragement that our souls truly need. Maybe another way to look at this would be to say, hey, if I'm coming to church every week and I go home thinking to myself, what a waste of time right? I didn't, I wasn't encouraged. I didn't get anything out of it. I didn't connect with anybody. I wasn't encouraged by the people there. Maybe the problem is me, right? Maybe the problem is I'm not being honest about the circumstances of my life. And that's why Paul sets this example for us here of really being honest about his circumstances, saying, remember my chains. See, we need to be honest about our circumstances to receive the kind of encouragement that we need together as the family of God. 
God. And so we realize we need uh, faithfulness. We need um, encouragement. And finally, probably the most difficult of all, we need forgiveness in our relationships with each other. Here's how Paul continues in this text. This is Colossians chapter 4, verse 9. He, Tychicus again, is coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you? Remember that line. Remember that. Who is one of you? They will tell you everything that is happening here. Now, to understand what Paul is getting at, we need to realize there's a little bit of a backstory happening here. So along with the letter that Paul sends to the Colossians, he also mails a letter to a man in the church named Philemon. The letter that he sends Philemon has been preserved. In fact, it is included in the New Testament of our Bibles. It's nestled quite comfortably between Titus and Hebrews. It is a very short book, and because it's so short, it's often overlooked. But I would suggest to you that when it comes to the topic of forgiveness, Philemon is the most powerful book in the Bible. I studied this with my small group years ago, and it's still my favorite small group study I've ever done. Because the reality is, if we're around other people, forgiveness is part of life, right? I mean, there are going to be times when people wrong us, and we have to offer forgiveness. And there's going to be times when we need to ask for forgiveness. And so the backstory here of what Paul is getting at is that there is this man, Onesimus, that he mentions here in verse 9 that we just read, Onesimus. Onesimus was a slave to a man named Philemon. Apparently, Onesimus stole from Philemon and took off on the run, a crime at that time that was punishable by death. So as you can imagine, Onesimus was on the run, and he was running fast, Right? And somehow along the lines, he crossed paths with the Apostle Paul. And Paul did what Paul did, right? He shares the gospel with him. And pretty soon, Onesimus becomes a Christian. His life is transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit, and he becomes a close friend of the Apostle Paul's. Now, Paul finds himself in the middle of this situation because all of a sudden, he's good friends with this man, Onesimus, but he's also good friends with Philemon. And so he takes this opportunity to teach the church what forgiveness truly looks like. And as we study this example, we learn several things of what this looks like. First of all, we realize that forgiveness is full and complete. It's full and complete. Now, we know that that's true in our relationship with Jesus, don't we? Right? That, that he washes our sins away white as snow. That he takes our sins, as he tells us, as far as the east is from the west, as far as they can possibly be taken. He sets this example of full and complete forgiveness. But do you realize that is the example he sets for us of what forgiveness looks like in our relationships? Right? I mean, sometimes I hear people say things like, hey, I I forgive, I just just don't forget. Right? But I, I don't see how that fits in the example Jesus sets. He doesn't tell us, hey, uh, I I forgive you, but I'm I'm not going to forget all those things you've done, right? Forgiveness is full and complete. See, what the world teaches us about forgiveness is that when somebody wrongs you, you never forget, right? And we end up with this sort of conditional forgiveness where we look at it and we say, hey, I'll forgive you if you prove to me who you are now, if you act in the way I want you to to act, if you do these things, then I'll forgive you. But that's not the example we see in the Bible. See, what Paul says is, hey, Onesimus is coming back to you. He's been forgiven by God. Now you need to forgive him. Years ago, one of my uncles went to some counseling, and um, after the counseling time, he, he used to always quote this thing that he learned from his counselor that he found very helpful, which was that there are situations in life that you need to deal with put behind you, and move forward. In fact, he even had hand motions he would do. He got to deal with it, put it behind you, and move forward. And he would reference this so often that he shortened it down to just sort of this flick of the wrist where you just sort of do this thing. Deal with it, put it behind you, and move forward. Now, I know that to say deal with it is a dramatic oversimplification of the complexities of forgiveness. But at some point in our lives, we need to be able to forgive, put it behind us, and move forward forward. Paul says, I am sending Onesimus back to you. He is a faithful and dear brother. He is one of you. Now, that's a powerful statement. If you remember, Onesimus was a slave to Philemon. 
And I think ultimately, I think Paul is making a statement about slavery here. Right? We know that God never wanted or intended slavery. And so Paul says, Onesimus isn't a slave. He's not less than you. He is your equal. Imagine the controversial nature of what Paul is saying here. In the world they lived in, slavery was part of life. Imagine what people outside the church were going to think of this. I mean, here comes Onesimus back to Philemon, not because he was arrested and drugged back, Instead, because he's choosing to come back, even though the punishment for what he had done was death, right? But now, instead of executing him, Philemon receives him back as a brother, as an equal. I mean, this would have made a tremendous statement to the world around them, probably an unwelcome statement from the position of those in power. I can't imagine the other Slave owners really like this idea, but ultimately what Paul is doing is he's turning society on its head and he's showing us that there is an entirely new way to live in the family of God and it involves full and complete forgiveness. Secondly, what we learn about forgiveness is it's what we have to do even if there is no apology. So I'm I'm somewhat struck by the fact that when you read through Philemon, Paul doesn't say anything about Onesimus having to apologize, right? He doesn't say, hey, hey, uh, um, finally, man, Onesimus is going to come back to you, grovel before you with a beautiful, heartfelt, meaningful apology. And if you choose to accept it, then you should forgive him. No, he simply says, hey, God's forgiven him. Now you need to forgive him. How often, how often do we stay bitter waiting for an apology. You're waiting for an apology that's probably never going to come, right? I mean, I've got a few people that I'd I'd love to have grovel before me with a beautiful apology. You know, it's not, it's not happening, right? So at some point in my life, I need to forgive because Jesus forgives. Forgive even if somebody doesn't apologize to me. Third, forgiveness leaves us vulnerable. It just plain does. I don't think there's any way around this, right? If we're on the side of things where we're offering forgiveness, it puts us in a position where we can be hurt again, doesn't it? And if we're the person asking for forgiveness, it puts us in a vulnerable situation. I mean, imagine the vulnerability of Onesimus in this moment, right? He is going back with the hope he's forgiven. He's either going to be forgiven or executed, right? He's got a lot on the line. This is life or death. And I imagine that's part of the reason Paul sends Tychicus along with him to make sure he actually went. I mean, have you ever had to do the right thing and you just didn't want to go? And you need a faithful friend like Tychicus there with you, sort of dragging you along to make sure you actually do it? See, because when it comes to things like forgiveness, oftentimes it's easier for us to do what Onesimus did the first time and run away. Right? It's easier to go to a new church, to find new friends, to move to a new place, to start a new life than it is to find reconciliation in the family of God because it often puts us in a very vulnerable place. But it is in those times where we continue to grow into the people that God is calling us to be. Fourth, forgiveness allows people to change. In life, we, we grow, right? We, we change. Um, if, maybe if you think back 20 years ago, you realize that over the last 20 years, you've, you've grown and changed, hopefully becoming more of the people that God is calling us to be. But maybe even if you think back just 10 years ago, you realize that 10 years ago, I would have said things, I would have done things, I would have acted in ways that I never would today, right? Because we've, we've grown, we've changed. In forgiveness, we realize that people change. So I think this is part of the reason that forgiveness is often hardest in families, right? Have you ever noticed how long family feuds can go on, right? Just, and, and I think part of the reason is because we really know each other, right? And so we think to ourselves, no, 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 I, I know who he really is, or I know what she's really capable of. And we recognize that the Holy Spirit has the ability to change us, but we forget that the Holy Spirit has the ability to change the lives of the people around us as well. And so that's why Paul, he sends Onesimus back, is a totally new person, right? Onesimus left as one person. His life was transformed by the, uh, the Holy Spirit. And he comes back as somebody totally 
different. I mean, a couple of weeks ago, Craig talked about a very theological idea, right? Our reconciliation with Christ. But here we see it very practically in our relationships with each other. What this reconciliation truly looks like through forgiveness of one another. I find it somewhat ironic that uh, Paul was imprisoned unjustly, yet he's defending someone who at that time would have been imprisoned justly. And ultimately what Paul is doing here is he's showing us that in the family of God, there's an entirely new way to live. He's turning society on its head and he's showing us a kind of forgiveness that's countercultural. It always has been. It was countercultural in the first century. It's countercultural today. Our ability to forgive will always be a standout marker of being a follower of Jesus because the way he calls us to forgive makes absolutely no sense to the world around us, but it is extremely attractive, right? Because in life, we're all going to find ourselves in places where we need forgiveness, right? Where we need forgiveness from our family, we need forgiveness from our coworkers or our, our friends or our neighbors. We're going to find we need forgiveness. And in those moments, it's incredibly refreshing to be part of a community of people who understand how to forgive the way that Jesus forgives. You know, in the following verses, uh, Paul continues to mention several more things that are important in our relationships with one another. But ultimately, how we relate to one another reveals how well we understand what Colossians is truly all about. See, understanding the gospel is a fascinating thing, right? Because there's knowing it, and then there's really knowing it. You know, sometimes it's easy for us to know what Paul says, the theology of it all, maybe even to memorize it. But as the old saying goes, the proof is in the pudding. Or the way Jesus puts it, the proof is in the fruit, right? He talks about it's being a tree that bears fruit. Now, I'm the kind of guy, I know absolutely nothing about vegetation, right? I can't get grass to grow. I can't tell you one species of tree from the next. But you know what? I can tell you when there's fruit on a tree. I can tell you when a tree is growing, right? If we truly understand that there is no aspect of humanity that has been left untouched by the love of Jesus, it will be obvious in how we relate to one another, if we truly understand the work that Jesus did on the cross, people will know us as unusually faithful. Those around us will be shocked by how we encourage one another and those who hurt us will be in awe of how we forgive. Let's pray together. Lord, grant us understanding May we not just know the truth in our minds, but may we know it in our hearts in a way that transforms how we relate to others, how we relate to the world around us. Lord, help us to live now in this present day as the people you are calling us to be, the people that we will one day fully become in heaven. Lord, teach us to be faithful. Show us how to encourage each other. And Lord, probably the most difficult of all, help us. Help us through the power of your Holy Spirit to forgive as you have forgiven us. In Jesus' name, amen.